see if this works. Okay, so um, last week we were talking about if we're going to have this reformation, if we're going to have a change uh, of how Christians rethink our business practices and our financial infrastructure, don't we first need a revelation of what our sin is, what, a, what our issues are as a nation? Because I think one of the enemy's tricks, I'm talking about the devil, uh, is that he has intelligently designed things to appear hidden and to kind of sneak up on us. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is if you look at a lot of the problems of our day, it's a mixture. It's a mixture of a little bit of truth with uh, a little bit of lies. And even as we look at our economy um, and our, especially our publicly traded mechanisms, um, we see that this has happened. So it's worthwhile exploring this a little bit further. Um, a lot of people will demagogue Wall Street, and that's only half the issue. You know, we can blame someone. We can always find a scapegoat. But what if we actually are participants, and Wall Street is nothing more than a great facilitation of our own heart and our own desires? Um, that makes it more concentrated, perhaps. Perhaps the sin is greater there. Perhaps not, though. Um, but if we're complicit, if we're going along because there's, hey, that's just the way it works and there's no alternative and this is like our, uh, we turn on our lights and have electricity, we turn on our faucets and we have water, we turn on our bank statements and accounts and we have money. Um, we've got to realize what the issues are. So part of this is educational and corresponding with each other and, um, you know, one of the things that I've really felt has been unmasked in this journey of mine, uh, coming out of Wall Street and the mindset of, hey, capitalism is great. It's God's gift to us. We just need to deploy our capital efficiently and God loves free freedom and free markets and he does. But what are the, one of the issues that we've gotten fooled about is that with our focus on the capital as the top thing, the top dog, if you will, the profitability, We've lost the heart for Jesus and truly God being at the center of our nation, ourselves, our communities. Uh, and when we lose that footing, uh, even if we're not aware of it, it draws our heart away from God. And we can even be religious and have a little bit of God and a little bit of profitability and uh, gaining of wealth. Uh, Jesus was clear. He said, where you store your treasures, there your heart lies. And he was talking about don't store your treasures on earth, but rather in heaven, where moth and rust destroy. And what Jesus is not saying is don't be a good steward. He's not saying don't be a, uh, someone who provides an inheritance. No, what he's saying is don't store up for yourself a way to save yourself. You can't do it. And where your heart is, um, there, your allegiance will lie. And so we're going to talk a little bit today, and I'd love to hear from others what, what they feel like the Lord is saying on this, is that the church needs to come out and understand how, we have, how, how the systems we operate in have programatized, um, if you will, have, have um, institutionalized, let's just say it, greed. So Greed is wrong. Uh, one of the greatest sins of Sodom and Gomorrah was not just the going after strange flesh, but was really their greed. They wanted more. They were uh, uh, unhappy with their state of affairs. They just were after more and more in their lives. And if you can understand it, Sodom is, a, is an issue that we can fall into the trap of. We can even say, like, well, in, out of my one pocket, I pay my taxes, and so the government will provide and help for the poor. Out of another pocket, I give, um, and I try to do my part in helping people, too. But if my main concern is preservation of my own wealth and uh, earning a way to take care of myself and my family through money, um, and I'm talking about what's priority, then we can even be deceived. So uh, if, you, if you really get under the covers of how our 
economy works, how our banking system works, and especially how our publicly traded markets work, you will see what has become systematized in terms of this greed. Why, how is it systematized? Well, well, why is it greed? Well, when we put the profit at the top, profitability, and seeking after an increase of profitability, it becomes the priority. It becomes the God, if you will. And uh, even when we invest and participate in the system, because we're owning a part of it, we come into it as well. Uh, so we're not innocent in participating in it. I, I know many people who say like, no, 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 I'm not greedy like those Wall Street guys, but I gotta be smart about my money. So where do I put it to work? Well, I, I have a great financial advisor and he shows me where I need to invest. Well, guess what? That investment just goes right back into the systematized issue. Um, good economy under God is more like private enterprise, especially family businesses that have been around for generations. Entrepreneurialship, this is all good. Um, but entrepreneurialship with an eye on the golden calf, that's not so good. As soon as we take the capital in an investing sense, as soon as we take the capital, let's say we desire to make a, a startup company in the technology realm. Um, well, the best way of doing that in today's way of thinking is you want to be seated by Kleiner Perkins. You want to be seated by, or if not seated, you know, you want to be funded by the best, um, you know, Menlo Park private investment houses, uh, venture capital houses. But when you do that, when we do that, it's all geared to the ultimate brass ring. What is that? Tenfold return, hundredfold return. We're going to make it big. We can even lose money in the context of this capital, but as long as our eye is on the prize of selling to someone who's greater and perhaps publicly traded or going public ourselves, what are we after? Are we after sustained goodness and helping people? Or are we really after the big golden egg that gets laid at the end of the rainbow and then we made it there, we can make it anywhere, we, we're, we're successful, we're the American dream, we could be the next billionaire. So you can see that even, even as whatever, whenever we take the money and that money has the strings attached to it of these return expectations, these multiples uh, of gains, we're a part of that system. The system basically says, hey, Business is business. I make my money and then it's up to me individually what I do with it. But what God is arresting us and saying like, don't be like that, don't be like Sodom, where in the process of your gain, you're not considering the people that you may have even enslaved in order to get your gain or uh, stepped on or taken advantage of or used. Um, that God cares firstly and foremostly in every aspect of what we're doing, that we're serving him and we love people and we're trying to help people in commerce, people working with people. That's, the, that's God's vision for business and commerce. But this, the system that we're now a part of has become so systematized in its profitability. We have like Pharaoh's whip over the top of it, cracking it, saying we have we have legions of equity research analysts who are microscopically micromanaging every cent and half a cent and a bit of a cent of EPS growth. And if a company misses that growth, woe be to them, their stock price drops like a rock. And everything that is driven on that EPS and EPS growth then receives a multiple, this is how valuations work, a multiple on top of that, so it's magnified. And that ultimately is this brass ring. Hey, if shareholders could just get 30 times, 20, you know, if this technology company could have 100 times uh, revenue, what, how valuable would it be because of its future prospects? So all I'm trying to point out is that when we get sucked into this environment, we rationalize like, you know, it's okay. I, 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 I may make a lot of money, but I give a lot of money. And I think this is one of the things that's leading us into a, a disaster. And if you can understand it, um, these protests like uh, Occupy Wall Street are basically the element of truth 
in their in the protests, which is true, is that the systems, these capitalistic systems and structures do not have a regard for the people as high as they do the money and the profit. And there's a lot of other stuff that gets twisted into that, Marxism, socialism, um, revolution, you know, for, for purposes that are not godly purposes, but make no mistake, like there's an element in these, in that type of protest that's actually on point and God sees it this way, even if the church doesn't. And so that's what we're here to talk about today. And of course, we always talk about what is the different way of living? How does God want us to live? But we need to realize that this system is being judged and it's we're going through a process, waves of judgment. And so in that context over decades, how should the church react? How should we react as individuals? How should we understand what the problem is and then not per, be a participant in it, either passively or actively. So I uh, want to open the floor up now and uh, let people, uh, you know, share their perspective on this or ask questions about, well, maybe this is an overreaction, Greg. Maybe this is an overindictment. Um, doesn't God love, you know, our, the freedom for us to trade and things like that. So I'm happy to, to take this and whatever direction the Holy Spirit leads, and um, let's have a nice uh, discussion and rigorous debate. And you'll see in the email that I sent um, some of the specific items uh, that list some of, some of these issues out a bit. Uh, you know, for example, hiding behind the op op opacity of shareholders' interests. Uh, Wall Street profit expectations and the roles of research analysts that is leveraged to maximize profit, the advent of the LBO and the hostile takeover uh, technology. I used to advise in that in mergers and acquisitions. Um, excess capital used for buying shares back instead of deploying into new growth ideas. Um, the role of the judicial system, the civil courts in all of how uh, this business operates or how big business, if you will, or publicly traded businesses operate um, and so forth. You can read through those. But if anyone wants to chime in here, either with their own testimony, their own experiences, their own revelation, what the Lord's shown, um, please, let's do that. Greg, right, uh, just to give everybody some background, I was a 20, I, I spent 21 years on Wall Street as a derivatives trader and portfolio manager for major international banks. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm immersed in capitalist activity and thinking and like, uh, it'll seem like Greg and I pre-planned our views on this, but you know, I, I, what he stated is exactly where I'm at. I see in the common good in the common realm the voice of god coming through people who don't know god fully i'd call some of them the not yet believers because they've tapped into the truth of god and be, you know this in the evangelical church in particular we are replicating the cycle of israel where there's been an obedience in a certain area with kingdom principles we get blessed generationally, but then we, we lose sight of how we got blessed and we lose sight of the fact that we're, we were never perfect to begin with, even in that evangelical movement in mm. theology and in practice. And so we've been unable to hear and see the God operating in the common realm. Um, so Occupy Wall Street, indeed, a baseline of truth but there's nowhere to go for the people who don't know grace and freedom like the church uh, could bring into this equation. So they have to go to the socialist answers because the church has not been responsive to the cry of the oppressed. Mm -hmm. And as Greg mentioned about Sodom, we would often in the evangelical movement just focus on the sexual sin as the wanting more, which was so well said. But in, Z in Ezekiel, 1649 and i'll put that on the chat it says uh 
uh, pride, gluttony, laziness, while the poor and needy suffered were the reason for their judgment. So if you combine that with the passage in June, which talks about the, sec the sexual uh, excess, it's always personal and collective sin working together that combine to invite the correction of God for the church or the judgment of God on society. So those things are always together. And unfortunately, because of America's history, we have peeled away the biblical justice aspect and sort of kept that at bay while we've cultivated personal responsibility and personal virtues uh, to the highest uh, position in, in our faith. And so I think the church is being called to recapture uh, mm. justice in the seven mountains of culture the aspect of justice and, and, and to be open to the fact that there has been racial hierarchy from the very beginning in the nation. And that's spread globally over 400 years and to understand the, its uh, connection to what I would call unbridled capitalism, capitalism, capitalism that's not been rooted sufficiently in Judeo-Christian ethics. Uh, Harvard can have as many liberal you know, socially minded professors as they want. But when the Harvard Endowment Fund, billions and billions, uh, makes these unbelievable returns over the last 20 years because of LBOs, buying these companies up that Greg mentioned, uh, chopping the workforce down of a perfectly good company to spruce it up for sale to get a maximum multiple basically removing its core, it, it, removing its organs and selling a shell of itself at an inflated price only to doom its future while piling it up with debt to leverage their, uh, you know, EPS even further. The, the contrast for me is mind blowing <laughs> that the same, you know, so this is not a liberal conservative thing. This is not a Democrat Republican thing. This is a kingdom thing. And if we can get out of the political lens, this is a kingdom thing. And I really believe strongly about this. In reading a lot of the anti-racist material that's being generated both within the church and outside the church, outside the church, you will get a very strong challenge to capitalism itself. Um, there's no grounding in a Jeo-Christian um, mindset of the brokenness of humanity to the point where humanity can't be perfected without the move of God within it. If we as the church want or see capitalism as the best system going forward for the globe to reduce global poverty, we must have radical change. Um, as Abraham Lincoln said, I don't know what year he said, but uh, you know, he was very familiar with these issues of inequity. And he was a great thinker. He said, labor is the superior of capital. Now, when I read that, being a huge fan of Abraham Lincoln, and when I was in more of a capitalistic mindset that was not really as kingdom as I would have liked it to, to be a few years ago, that statement from basically my hero shocked me. It shocked me and it was scary. How could he think that? Well, I had an implicit understanding that Abraham Lincoln supported everything that I believed. You could say that for America, he, you know, because he was shot on Good Friday, because the nation, every family has essentially lost one son out of every family, because the national treasure was burned up during the Civil War, the after effect of Lincoln being shot on Good Friday and dying the next, next day was he was made a Christ figure. He, he spoke in the words of scripture and the, language, and the language of the people was based in scripture at that time. So we, we tended to make the ideal, we te we've tended to worship ideals instead of closing the gap between reality and ideal. And that's why we resist Occupy Wall Street. We need to lower people off pedestals, lower ideals, get them down, lift Jesus back up as the person, lower everything else, 
raise Jesus back up over every mountain of culture. And I don't mean come in and take dominion over it presumptively, but, but influence each realm, you know, as the servant of all, bringing God's truth, but not demanding power. So we've kind of done it the opposite. Mm. And that hasn't worked so well. So that's my little spiel there. That's great. I'll put a few of those things in the chat. Yeah, in fact, I was just in uh, the same scriptures this morning, which is the evidence of Sodom's sin. And the question for all of us, as you're really highlighting, is how has America been complicit in these similar ways? And uh, I love what you're saying, that uh, the church, the elephant in the room in the church can be this issue of capitalism. Well, we don't touch that because that's the golden rule and the golden calf. Thinking improperly, I'd, I'd argue, uh, this is Jesus's way. This is the best and highest, God's life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. That's capitalism. And what we have to realize is that capitalism was a term invented by Karl Marx. It was also uh, undergirded by the uh, theology of, if you will, of Adam Smith. Adam Smith famously wrote that the invisible hand um, that guides capitalism, that guides the rich man who makes his product and sells it and has an excess, that that excess actually, even though it's not in his interest personally, helps everyone else. So that's like saying, if my greed and pursuit of gain um, is active, it's actually a public good. And the, the scriptures don't say that. The scriptures don't align with that. That's a misunderstanding. Um, you know, sometimes we refer to that as trickle down. Now, there's no question that a, that a benevolent, rich person, wealthy person can do good with it. Jesus admonished us to do that. But also remember, there's many people who fall into the rich young rulers camp, which is they, they can't leave that allegiance. And so I think in this all, we have to realize like, wow, we have to be, it's almost like we can't, if we go there, our whole idea of uh, American Christianity and prosperity theology kind of falls apart. Gee, if we let someone attack capitalism, we're, you know, what are we left with? We've got to defend that. And I think our defensiveness and defending the system is part of the devil's trick. And if we miss that, we are enforcing and reinforcing what Satan has intelligently designed to hold us captive. And make no mistake, it's a captivity. It's a slavery. When we become indebted and we become so focused on the increase and in the gain, um, we're slaves. And if you look at chattel slavery, and I put this as a comment as well, the slave trade, what was it all about? It was all about economics. It was about making money. It was about profiting from buying and selling people. And then it was about making money from profiting off the back of that purchased labor. And so we, unfortunately, even our nation, developed theology around that. that said, well, you know, there's a type of slave in the Bible, and Jesus said, and God said that Slaves, mind your masters, and you know we, we, we distort all this stuff, and we leave out all of the other biblical truth of what about the oppression? What about the taking away of a person's freedom? What about calling someone uh, less than human? What about all of these other issues? You know, So what we need to be careful of in the evangelical church is we're not being defensive about what Satan's trying to do to hold us all captive. And we need to realize that ca unbridled capitalism, we could come up with different terminology. We can debate about well, what would you like to call, you know, some people, there's a good book called Completed Capitalism. There's other books that continue to use the word. But capitalism isn't in the Bible. What's in the Bible is like good trade. People that, when people help people, let's have justice and righteousness at the gates. Let's do things and look to God for the increase, confirming his covenant. These are not the core principles of capitalism per se. The freedom part perhaps is, but 
you can't just say because there's one biblical principle in capitalism or even three or 10, that that makes it good and right in all of its forms. And I think that's really what we're discovering. The church is going to have to admit and repent, get a, re get a revelation about it. Because like, look, Steve and I came from a place where I didn't get it. I, I didn't understand it. I thought that this is as American and godly as apple pie and 4th of July. And so it's like the Lord had to take me through this journey to show me what what the real underbelly, I guess, is, even through our own economic pain, even through our own financial crisis. Um, but thank God for any and all of that, because if we don't, if it, we will not make it as a nation if we just keep hanging on to what God is saying, you've got to change and let go and repent of. Um, and I think there's, there's, there are systemic issues in our uh, economy. 70% plus now of our economy is either publicly traded or looking to be publicly traded. What does that mean? Well, that means is that, that that tail is wagging the dog. It, it, it fuels both sides of the political environment. This, this, this system has generated the money that everybody is feeding from that trough. And we're all complicit in it. It's not just like, oh, blame those guys. Like, I mean, it's easy to play that blame game, but we need to be honest. And even within our own rank, even within the Christian remnants, what, you know, where, where are we being complicit, silent, um, as, the, as, the, as the Sodomites were, uh, comfortable in our complacency? You know, the, the, some interpretations of that scripture talk about overfed, um, having an abundance of food, yet people are still hungry, unconcerned, have a careless ease. You know, we've grown comfortable as long as our family is taken care of, even as long as our church family is taken care of. And we think, well, that's God's blessing, and that's good, and that's good enough sometimes. And then I'll try to do whatever I can, you know, on top. But if we come out of that mindset and say, or, no, our whole economy should really be Christ-centered if we've been given this gift as a nation, one nation under God. That's not lip service. That's not just symbolism. That's not just Merry Christmas. That's like, how do you live your life? And uh, this is our economic dilemma in our nation. We're being torn between how long will you falter between two opinions? That's literally the scripture of what Elijah said in his day to all of Israel when they were trying to worship a little bit of Jehovah and a little bit of Baal. And Baal is just a Canaanite God that represents Satan's distraction and every other form of God or idol that will take our allegiance, even make a dual allegiance, and that can undermine the people of God. That was Balaam's strategy. That was his strategy of greed was to undermine Israel by getting them to worship other gods and marry other women who worshiped other gods. And it worked. It worked. It's working in our nation now. Let's, let's get a revelation of it. Let's get an understanding of it. To me, that's part of the revolution the church needs to bring to, to America. Brother Greg. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Let's, uh, John, go ahead. If you could give us a uh, one or two minutes. Yeah. I, yeah. I, as you, as you were sharing this, I, was, I thought back when I worked for Merrill, um, getting called into my <clears throat> my boss's office and and being warned about uh, you know sharing Jesus with some of the employees, <clears throat> and then I, as I was thinking about this, I was just how we how we because of our situations have to you know stand in line and do what they have commanded us to do and and how it corrupts our inner being because we're not working and doing what is really on our hearts morally and 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 how that erodes our very beings because we are falling in line with them and with the, with the thought that we could lose our jobs okay and yeah. but we're being untrue to ourselves and how that just deteriorates our inner moral principles and and so th this was what it was just jumping out of me how 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 it has affected 
all of us, as we, over the years, we kind of tuck it in a corner and we say, okay, we, we, we have to go that, or if they come across with a ruling about certain, how you handle certain personal situations and how we're forced into these boxes and we can't be the people that God has called us to be. And, yes, and, to minister. Right. and, and so that, I, I was just jumping out of me at all yeah. of it, how, how confining it was to us and how untrue we were to ourselves. Yeah, so what you're really driving at, which I agree with so much, is conformity. Yes. Jesus said, do not conform to the ways of this world. Amen. Yet our employments, our income, our investment strategies often require us subtly to do so. Hey, just focus at the business at hand. There's no room for these other things. That's not about achieving the objective in our business environment. And yes. when we do that, as the church, we're basically not being like Daniel in Babylon. We're not saying, well, listen, if I live or die, if you fire me or not, I just have to be true to my value. Amen. We instead rationalize and we just say like, no, God knows I need this income and I'll take care of the family. And after all, these ministries are depending on my, my giving. So I just need to, um, you know, quiet down. Um, people will even quote things like when uh, the Israelites were in Babylonian captivity, like just be quiet and plant here and be like, uh, you know, good, good citizens. That's not the same thing as the conformity issue. And God wants us to be set apart consecrated that's to me that's the best definition of holiness is to be set apart for god not compromising um to get to just for expediency a political expediency economic expediency uh, being willing to die being willing to lose being willing to sacrifice being willing to get run over being willing to be uh you know be pick up our cross and follow jesus that's what we're called to do as christians Amen. Uh, Merrick, you wanted to say something. Please, go ahead. Thank you, Greg. Good, great discussion. Uh, we, we started this day with, Lord, make me a sanctuary. And that's what we really truly need to enter into and recognize, as, as John has said, as Steve has said, as you said, Greg, you know, this is about a shift, a transition that's going to be so massive, I think we're going to be hit with a freight train. Um, interestingly enough, I wrote this Ezekiel uh, 16 verses 49 and 50 here before I had this before Steve spoke it. So, Greg, you came up with it. Let me just read my full passage here, verses 49 and 50, because I think it's we haven't fully covered that yet. Um, it's been well presented, but just hear this out. Look, verse 49. This was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. You know, I believe the church really desires to strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And God sees that through our tithing, through our offerings, through our this ministry, association, intercession, and and helps that we do with, with people one-on-one -on -one in a group situation. So the Lord sees that we are desiring that. Our heart, um, the, where our treasure is, there our heart will be. Um, the, the issue for me is, is largely that pastors don't understand the nature of the, the fiat system that we've inherited from the Federal Reserve. Um, people just generally don't understand what money is. If you take a dollar bill out of your wallet, I don't have my wallet with me, if you take a dollar bill out, and you ask somebody, what is it? They will completely not understand what it is. It's a dead instrument. There's no equity in the system. So if, you, if people say, well, we should pay off the national debt, do you realize that would cause the entire currency to go out of circulation? People don't understand these simple truths. So um, I just want to harken back to also uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8 that we that was read, uh, Chris, Led, read last week, Chris, uh, Lucy read. Just let me go back to verse two of chapter eight. I think it's so relevant. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all of the way these 40 years. So we've been over 100 years under the rule of the Federal Reserve. In 1913, we're 107 years. In the wilderness, 
we've been led to a wilderness, folks, to humble you and to test you and to know what was in your heart. I think we're, we're facing a, a massive collapse. And uh, I thought it would, it would happen before now. I, I think we're just briefly, just the asset bubble that we saw coming out of 08 was just meant for the banks to make more money. And we, they reinflated it even today. Uh, so I don't know how much of the money has gone to Main Street, which will go into inflation, but I think it's probably significantly more now than it was in 08. There wasn't virtually anything in 08. So I think we're at a, at a place, and let me just add one more thing, and that is that if I look at what I'm seeing in the, the protests and the riots and the, the mayhem and the chaos, the anarchy, the Marxist anarchy, the communist sympathizing, the, the destruction that we're seeing in Seattle with CHOP, uh, in Minneapolis, uh, all across this country, just things that we, would ne we never thought we'd ever see. I never thought I'd ever see it. But we're seeing an acceleration of things that are just, it's mind boggling to me. And I'm, I'm expecting there to be um, a day of reckoning where the system is just going to fail. What, why do I say that? We've come out of a place of, of great economic surplus, economics of abundance for decades. We've managed the system to work more abundance all the time, we, neglecting the, uh, the asset bubbles and the malalignment of asset investments to to bring us back to a sense of reality, what's real. We don't even know what's real anymore in the economic system. So I think we're going into a, a time of economics of great scarcity. And I think we have to prepare for that. And I think God is gonna to say to us, even in your times of scarcity, I'm gonna provide for you because I want you to strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. I don't wanna destroy you, I want to bless you. So it's uh, the transition we face, I think is, is really even largely unseen by us. We don't know how it's going to happen. Well, we know it's, it's a combination of social forces, economic forces, international forces with, co with communist China taking the lead in things and it, causing this COVID virus to be transported to the international world system and killing thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. So we, we're, we're at a time where we, it's, it's, it's really scary. Um, yeah. So and I, uh, yes and amen, I just sent in the link chat a uh, uh, article I wrote five years ago that talked exactly what you're saying uh, in terms of the, the America and the church are going to enter into this desert time. And actually, interestingly enough, that whole article was written about the contrast between Lot's choice of the fertile plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh -huh. Hold on. So we just uh, three one zero. Can you mute? Hello. There we go. Someone came in and out. Okay. So um, you know this this our very article, which came from a prophetic dream that I had, uh, July fourth, two thousand fifteen had to do with the choice between what Abraham decided and what Lot decided. When they had their um, experience together and their flocks were getting numerous and they had sort of disputes, uh, they decided to separate. And interestingly, Abraham let Lot choose. You choose where you wanna go, I'll just go the other way, which is an amazing thing, really. I mean, patriarch, he was, you know, the, he was Lot's, uh, elder and basically said you choose where you want to go and what did Lot chose he chose the fertile plains of Sodom and Gomorrah and we know how that ended up and the reason he chose it perhaps is because he was saying naturally like hey it's fertile plain it's lush good good crops grow there and what was Abraham left with well he was left with a desert known as the Negev Desert, which is also the promised land of Israel. It's an arid place. So, but by Abraham's choice of uh, allowing God to lead him, he came into that promised land, and the promised land desert became the oasis of later Israel. And even today, Israel thrives in a desert land. And I think that's a message for us, as these systems are judged, as the even the church is judged, 
we have to learn how to operate in a difficult situation. But if we trust and lean on the Lord, he will provide us the knowledge of him, the relationship with him, the covenant with him, and yeah. he will make a way in the desert. He will make a way. I, this article talks about technology because that was part of the dream. I believe that in that dream, the technology was representative of the knowledge of God. That if we just have the knowledge of God, we have everything we need. We can survive in any environment. We can thrive in any environment. And as the church thrives and survives in any environment, that's so attractive and such a great witness to all. Um, but it requires that we come out of the mindset of Lot, which is, listen, I, you know, I want, I just, I don't know about the desert. I just want, I think God wants to bless me and provide those fertile <laughs> plains over there. And we've got to stop thinking that way as a church. We, we can't keep defending what God is saying is unjust and unrighteous. We have to stop defending that. We have to allow God to uh, search our hearts and show us what's, you know, what this system, what, what is the problem with what our, our current system is? Let's not assume that when we say God bless America, that just means the stock market goes up. Right. But yet, when, right. when we say, let the economy thrive, even as Christians with good intent, guess what? Right now, that means the stock market has to go up. Do we realize that? Our economy can't go up in a meaningful, move the needle way in the current structure without the idolatrous system producing a result. And so then it's like, whoa, if that's true, like, what does this mean? And yes, this is the revelation we need to ponder, is that we can't have an economy that increases because of the blessing of God without it increasing all of the systems of unrighteousness, greed, wickedness. And so we've so conflated ourselves in our modern economy that we were like, whoa, how do we pray even? Like, Lord, bless Connecticut's economy. But if that means like more venture capital, more hedge fund money, more taxes that are coming on the back of that, do we really want to pray that? I don't think so. I think we want to pray for a righteous economy. Lord, bless us in a, in a way that's truly biblical and get us out of these systems of greed. Detach us from um, the things that are, are you're judging. And so this, this poses a dilemma. So here, How do we Greg, pray for economy? Go ahead. So, Greg, thank you for sending me this prayer that you are, this prophetic vision that you had back in 15, um, to a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to read one statement that you made in this uh about Abraham separating from Lot. Without being set apart and consecrated, Abraham couldn't have walked into his inheritance. I think God's going to separate us from this whole system. I don't think we're just going to be able to set, up, set it down as long as it's functioning and operating. And we just, we seem to think that we can, you know, we still have this economics of prosperity working for us. We can't separate ourselves from it. I think God's going to have to break us from it. And bring right. us into that, yeah. into that one, one point, into that desert. I mean, when Abraham was called of God, as you said so well many weeks ago, when he left the Ur of Chaldees in his father's house, he came into the land that God wanted to give him. The first thing he saw was famine. The first, that's what he saw. That's what he experienced was famine. Where's the blessing, Lord? There was no blessing immediately in that. But I think God was making it, showing him that I'm going to, bless you as I choose to bless you. And when you come back out of Egypt, I didn't even send you there. You, you came out with wealth from Egypt. You set yourself up in this, with, a, with, with Lot in the, on the plains, and you, not the plains of Sodom, but you did well in that time. But then there was another period where Abraham was called to go into the desert. Jesus was called to go into the desert immediately after he was baptized by John the Baptist. It's not coincidental these things happened. We, no. we must go through our deserts uh, individually and also corporately sometimes like Israel. Right. I want to shift to Jonathan because I heard Jonathan try to insert um, his voice. Jonathan? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Just, um, you know, in listening to the conversation, I had a, a thought I wanted to put forth. And um, it's regarding the theme that keeps on coming up in today's conversation, which is 
um, this faltering of two opinions or this um, decision between one or the other. Um, you, you mentioned it between Abraham and Lot, and then um, earlier how Elijah um, mentioned this uh, there on the mountaintop. But we, what's so interesting about that is that that seems to be not only a recurring theme in this conversation, but a recurring theme for the people of God throughout history. And what's interesting about it is that this month that we've just entered into in the Hebrew calendar being the month of Tammuz um, is actually that month that that happened for the Israelites. The 17th of Tammuz is when um, Moses went up to the mountaintop and the golden calf was made and crafted and put together. It's in this month that the people of God were in so many different time periods um, faced with this dilemma. And I'm sure it's, it's every day, but but somehow or another, this cycle happens where um, in this time period, this is when the children of God have an opportunity to see him face to face like Moses was invited to. And yet they say, no, we're going to stay at the foot of the mountain. You go up and you tell us what, what he says. And then while he's up there, they begin to craft and make this golden calf. And um, three weeks later, the ninth of Av, which is considered one of the the saddest or the most tragic days in Israel's history is when many times um, things have happened like the, the desecration and the destruction of the Holy temple in Jerusalem. And so we, there's a cycle of God placing this an opportunity before us where we have a chance to not falter between two opinions, but choose like Joshua would say, you know, I, for me in my house, I would choose to serve the Lord and for us to choose God. And I think we have that opportunity now. We're sensing this in the spirit in this conversation. And we're saying there's this system that is before us. And no matter how beautiful and elegant and, and great it looks on the outside, there seems to be this mixture happening, which is what Babylon is all about. But this mixture of, well, in order for me to take some of the good, I have to take some of this bad or maybe more of the bad just for me to be able to do this. Um, for God, in quotation. And so I, I just think that it's, that we're talking about this, but yet this is actually the month that we entered in yesterday. This is the month that we're entering into. And when we start noticing and recognizing the enemy's tactics and how it's just being that um, Jesus said that he was the father of lies um, and he says no truth is in him, that he can stand in truth, which means that Sometimes he uses a mixture of things. And, and so him, the enemy being the, not only the ultimate deceiver, but the scripture says that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Well, you can't steal, kill, or destroy anything that hasn't been created. So I can't steal, kill, or destroy the air that's next to me, excluding the air. I'm talking about just some imaginate, imaginated, uh, you know, something that's been imagined, but it's something like the couch that's sitting right in front of me. I can destroy that. The person um, that is before me, I can kill that. I can steal something, uh, an object, something that has already been created. The enemy doesn't have that capacity to be able to create. So all he can do is pervert or contort or twist or try to destroy or steal or kill what God has already put forth. And so when we see these protests and these different things like Occupy Wall Street or um, even the Black Lives Matter movement and Antifa and stuff like that, there is this element of truth that has been twisted and contorted and, and the enemy has ultimately given them a falsification of what they're really doing. Although it originated with this, may, maybe this righteous thought of, you know, hey, what about, what about the little guys? What about, you know, these people that have been oppressed? And then all of a sudden the enemy comes in and just twists and contorts it, just like you, you were mentioning about Occupy Wall Street. There was these motives that could have been seen as, hey, you know what, those seem to be righteous, but yet ultimately it ends up being this very perverted and wicked um, thing that comes from it. And so in, in noticing that, I just say that when we, we are in that moment right now where we are placed in this valley of decision where we can look at whatever's before us and say, ultimately, we choose God and his ways and his righteousness and his justice and his mercy Lord, reveal to us your wisdom and how to not only just um, go about and navigate through the times and the things that we're dealing with, but ultimately to serve one another and to seek your face. How do we do that? 
And I think we're in that moment and we're seeing these uh, with those that have eyes to see and ears to hear. We're seeing these these things in these movements that we're noticing like, hey, the enemy is hijacking this and the enemy is is um, perverting and twisting this. And it ultimately is is from him, which becomes wicked, because this is a moment where the people of God rise up. And I believe that that because the enemy's plan is just to twist and contort God's plan, God's plan ultimately is that in this moment, he would raise up his people and we would be a strong and valiant people. Just like when we came out of Egypt, um, we were the armies of the Lord. And I think we're on the cusp of that, but the enemy is trying to put a strangle on that and twist it and, and do what he's doing right now and with what we see in, in the news every day. Amen. And I think really what we're seeing is this twisted truth is really twofold. It's a judgment of the church for not speaking up and doing something about the injustices, number one. Yeah. Then number two, it's an opportunity for the church to rise up, stop being um, complacent, stop. You know, Martin Luther King was raised up as a man of God to speak to what was unrighteous. And he had a biblical foundation for everything that he did. Um, this is the kind of leadership we lack today in the church. We as the church must rise up like Martin Luther did, Martin Luther King Jr. And we must speak the truth. In order to do that, we've got to come out of our complicity with what's evil. And if we can do all of this, I think that is the very thing that God is working on in the United States today. That is the very thing that could be the church's greatest opportunity and our finest hour. But it's going to require that we stand up and speak a voice of truth that is no longer, I guess, allied to or restricted by anything else, whether it's money, politics, um, our comfort, whatever the issues are, and there are many, and we read about them in Revelations 2 and 3. But if we can come, if we can come out, if we can as the church speak that voice of truth and be that lighthouse and live that way, which is really what we're talking about when we speak about the apostolic hubs and the Reformation, that is what God is actually looking for us to do. But if we want to remain in the old, we'll never get there. If we're too comfortable with how it's working today, and we just say, like, let's, you know, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Like, you know, it's, it's okay to just keep going as we are. That, that is not going to work. And um, I think we're, we're seeing, we are seeing the birth pangs of literally that. And this, too, is also a part of the church coming out of Babylon, uh, every spot and wrinkle within the church being uh, repented of, um, being uh, torn apart. Um, you know, literally when Ezra preached the word of God, rightly dividing the truth, it required a response. And the people responded. The people said, we will divorce our wives who were the foreigners with foreign gods. I think of how hard that is. That, that is like us separating from the golden calf of this modern economy. We're going to have to do it. I think that sure, God could reform the whole thing like uh, within, but like Martin Luther did within the church, what we call the Catholic church today, but what was the church back in the 1500s, he was not there to try to convince people within, let's have some change. Maybe we could have one thesis change and that would be good enough. He said, no, we have to leave. We have to start over. And I think that's a bit of where we are too, economically with this, with this system and the finances is sure, there could be reforms. We could pass some more laws. There, but look, we're because of the way it's been set up, because of the way the system is structured, and it's been intelligently designed to do so, unless it fails, can, we, can it really change from within? Or do we need an external reformation, um, which is what we're talking about here on this call, so. 
Greg, Greg, you, Greg, you're so right. You're so right on with this. I was wondering, in my heart, if we could ask Joel to speak from his perspective. Uh, okay, we are. Uh, Joel is there. He's just unmuted. Joel, yeah. would you like to contribute? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think a lot of. All right. Yeah. Take care. I, so I think something that's major about the the Lot and Abraham um, story is that um, there is this like smidgen of disobedience um, in Abraham, which is wild because like we we think of Abraham as like the father of faith, um, and what happened with Abraham is Abraham was told to leave his family and go west. Um, but here comes Lot, who's like, "Hey, can I go with you?" And he's like, "Yeah, sure." Um, but like that, that smidgen of, of disobedience, um, even if it, if it didn't seem like it was the wrong thing to do, um, it created conflict. Um, and so what, what ends up happening um, is like, it's, it's conflict that, you know, brings Abraham into situations where he has to compromise. It's like that one compromise, you know, makes it so that he ends up, you know, lying to, um, to different people about who his wife was, um, all these things. Um, and eventually that's what it was. It was just like, actually, like, I need to just like cut off and separate. Like you do what you're going to do, but like, I got to do what like God's called me to do. Um, yeah. And so like that, that separating, you know, we, we think of, we think of ways that, um, the church has been disobedient in terms of, you know, what it allows to creep into its, its doctrine, what, um, like all of these types of things. Um, but like, that is like the appropriate response is like when it's, when it's understood is to cut it off um, mm. and just like move on and trust that like God will create and form a, a direction um, to, to complete what he's called us into. Um, yeah. And also I have a praise report to share. Um, so um, about in January, well, actually, like for the last like year and some change, I've been really praying about like what God wanted me to do for work. Um, mm. And I had had some ideas about like building um, a prayer shed in my backyard and thought I could make it like really artful and something that could be profitable, something that could be sold. Um, and in January, God was like, um, like, hey, like start that business before the end of January. Um, so like I got all the legal structure together, did an LLC. Um, and like the mission of the LLC was to design, construct, and occupy Christ-centered spaces for prayer and worship. Mm -hmm. um, and like the more that I look at that mission, like that covers everything from like, you know, cleaning up a Christian's house for them to like church planting. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it does so in a way that um, is taxed. Um, and so what that means is like, um, like this business if it becomes uh, missional which like it is um it will be contributing to you know wherever i live in a way that has um political pull because that's what taxes are is like political pull um and it it brought up interesting ideas about you know what would it be like if you know the church was paying taxes on properties what would it be like um all these different things um what would it mean to like have the church take um, a different type of influence um, where there is need. Um, but that's a whole other conversation. But sure. um, so during, you know, quarantine, um, so, so the, the idea was to, was to build these prayer sheds, um, get a network of people with them in their backyards that would be willing to temporarily house people with like housing insecurity. Um, so, you know, whether that means, okay, for the month of February, um, I'm going to run a, um, uh, an extension cord and put a space heater in there and a mattress and somebody can stay in there um, when it's really cold. Um, and like, that's my commitment for this space. Um, and so, you know, during quarantine, um, I was like, oh, well, you know, I can't really do the business aspect of this, but like I can build something for my neighbors um, in like in our shared backyard. Um, mm -hmm. And as soon as I started the business, I was gifted a van, um, which I wasn't able to register. And so I was like, all right, well, I can turn this van into like a sleeping space. Um, and so like, there was just like this, 
this there's something about completely submitting this business to the Lord. Um, mm. that the the abundance that was present um, was just completely different than I had expected. So, um, you know, the the prayer bench was built around an object lesson um, for three young boys that um, I share a backyard with, um, which we just completed yesterday. Um, and they were able to learn about um, submitting um, to one another in like really mm -hmm. powerful, beautiful ways. Um, they were able to learn about submitting to um, authorities in places that God has placed them, um, which was like their parents for, for this. Sure. Thing. Um, and like submitting to God um, and being able to turn to God and be like, hey, I want to follow you deeper, um, but I don't know what's like getting in the way of that. So please help me. Um, and so, you know, that looked like um, sacrifice in odd ways um and then like those objects of sacrifice um were like taken away um such that what could be seen was the sacrifice of the lord um mm -hmm. and so this like beautiful prayer space that was built i think i think i spent like 50 dollars on materials the rest was like purposed wood uh, built it out of rafters from a home i'd helped uh, demo um and pallet wood um and um what was amazing also is there was a man who ended up um, being like temporarily homeless. Um, he couldn't stay in our house for like some legal reasons. Um, and so like, like probably a couple nights a week, he would stay in our van. Um, he'd stay in our van. And then um, yesterday I finished the prayer shed with the object lessons completely. Um, it was completely done. The boys got to put these like nice jars into like the slots of the cross that like it was built around. Um, and this man found housing. Um, so wow. like, yeah. And so it's like this, like the complete submission of this business um, created an abundance um, mm. that was just worlds beyond what I could have imagined. I was like, okay, like I might be able to make a couple thousand dollars a month. Like if I do this consistently, I was thinking about all these different ways, but like it, it fulfilled its mission of like teaching people how to follow Jesus like effectively um, and like, <laughs> or, and um, you know, providing like the temporary needs um, to like push towards um, like more long-term needs. Um, and that was just like, okay, God, like, what do you want me to do next? Okay, God, what do you want me to do next? Oh, I've got to, you know, rip those pallets apart for a week. Like, okay, God, like, what do you want me to do next? Um, yeah, and that was like the fruit of it. Love it. Thank you for sharing that with us because you're also illustrating that the abundance was not measured in dollars. It was measured in the abundance of all things in life. It was measured in a way of impacting people and how that creates such a joy in you and them. Um, you know, you got gifted a van that was non-monetary. That man had homeless shelter in your van and then got shelter, probably non-monetary. So we just, it's just such a wonderful way of looking at it. Meanwhile, you and your family all along have been taken care of, I'm assuming that everything else is going well. And that's, that's another great thing too, is like we've got to realize that our businesses and our, and our, our missions or whatever we're doing, that's not what provides for us and our family. What provides for us and our family is God himself. And he confirms his covenant and then provides in any way that he so deems fit. And it's a better way. It's a way that releases us into um, with no sorrows added to it. That's the, the scripture about how God increases us. He increases us with no sorrow added to it. So thank you for sharing that, brother. Um, this has been great, guys. It's 10.06. We're going to wrap up. Um, if we could have somebody close us in prayer. Actually, Joel, would you close us in prayer? Um, carrying on from your testimony and thought? Yeah, glad to. Uh, so Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that your ways are better than our ways. Uh, yeah, help us to, to run with it. Help us to run with you um, rather than just running with, uh, with a stick and hitting rocks over and over. Um, you know, help us to be your people. Help us to um, 
transition from hitting the rock uh, to speaking to the rock, um, to demonstrating the power that, that you have and that you've given us, um, mm. to demonstrate the ways that you've intended us to lead, um, to demonstrate um, the fullness of words. Uh, your word says that uh, we'll have to give account for every empty word. Let us be living in ways that our words are full mm. and our words uh, bring glory to you. Whether that be in our economy, in our you know, political sphere, in um, you know, our homes, with our families, Lord, let every word be full and bring glory to you. We ask these things yes, in Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen, everybody. Amen. Thank you for joining, participating, and sharing, and God is good. Um, we'll see you guys hopefully next week or sometime soon. Be blessed. Thank you, Greg. It was a great blessing. Thank you. Yeah. yeah shalom, buddy. You. Shalom, everybody. God bless shalom. you. Thanks, everyone. Shalom. Shalom, John. <laughs> Peace. <laughs>